Well, good evening and welcome. My name's Andrew Petter, and I'm president of Simon Fraser University. Uh, let me start by acknowledging the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil peoples on whose traditional territories we're privileged to gather this evening. And let me welcome you. Uh, what a wonderful turnout for tonight's uh, president's faculty lecture with uh, Professor Zutsi Yao. And what a great turnout uh, we have for tonight, reflecting, I think, what has been an extraordinary degree of interest in this event. And that interest, I know, has come from individuals. It's come from groups in the community. I understand we have a Douglas College anthropology class here. Is where are you out there somewhere? Yeah, I see their hands going up. We have students from Capilano University who are prepping to attend a field school in China. Is that right? We even, we even have the Dean of the Faculty of Communication, Art and Technology, Aoife McNamara, right here in the front row. So you know this is gonna be quite a lecture tonight. And I'm just delighted that you could join us. Uh, as I'm sure many of you know, we at Simon Fraser University have made it our mission to be Canada's most community-engaged research university. So when the community turns out like it has tonight, it makes us very, very happy. And this President's Faculty Lecture Series is part of a larger program called SFU Public Square, which is very much a signature of our commitment to be an engaged university. I encourage you to look on the SFU Public Square website. Uh, I'll mention some things coming up at the end, but you'll find a lot of activities uh, that I'm sure will interest you there. Our goal is to provide opportunities for the community to come together with the university to uh, provide you opportunities to learn from some of our leading scholars, but also to ask questions and to make comments and to have a conversation. And tonight there will be a chance for you to raise questions and offer comments after the lecture. We'll also have a, uh, whoops, we'll have to correct that. We'll also have a, a, a modest reception afterwards with some coffee and cookies and you're welcome to stay back. And I know that Professor Zhao has agreed kindly to stay back uh, for a period of time and answer some of those. Uh, you should also note this lecture will be filmed for and available on our uh, SFU YouTube channel. So if you do ask a question, you may end up on that channel. I also have a request from SFU School of Communications. They say please use the hashtag SFUCMNS. So that's SFUCMNS on your social media sites so our communications colleagues can see your posts. And I'll give it to you one more time, S-F-U-C-M-N-S. -S. And now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Zhao who will be uh, presenting tonight's lecture. Uh, Yutsi Zhao is a professor in SFU School of Communications where she holds a Tier 1 Canada Research Chair in the Political Economy of Global Communication. She studied journalism at the Beijing Broadcasting Institute before coming to SFU to pursue her master's degree in 1986, and she went on to earn a PhD from SFU in 1996. Uh, Zhao is an award-winning scholar, earning the C. Edwin Baker Award and the Dallas Smythe Award for her contributions to the study of communication and democracy. She's also the recipient of SFU's prestigious Chris Dagg Award for international impact. Her research explores the political economy of global communication, media and democracy, and communication industries in China. She's also uh, an amazing educator, and she is the founding director of what is truly an extraordinary program, the Global Communication MA Double Degree Program. This is a program that's offered both at SFU and in the second year the students go and study at the uh, Communication University of China and provi it provides them a unique experience to immerse students in both Canadian and Chinese culture and scholarship, looking from both perspectives at global communication. So if you're thinking about a degree at SFU, this could be the one for you. <laughs> and uh, once you've heard tonight's lecture, I think it'll seal the deal. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Yuzi Zhao. Um, thank you so much, Andrew, for the introduction and for the invitation. Um, also for the promotion of my uh, double degree program. Uh, my dear colleague, Martin Laber, told me the other day that my picture looks angry and defiant. <laughs> I'm sure for a night like this, you come here not because of whatever I look. Like 
uh, Andrew was saying earlier, it's because of the topic. And I feel if I don't talk about the Bell on the Road, I will not live up to the uh, grandness of the President's lecture. And with this, I really invite you to think together with me, really, uh, about this topic. Okay, what's next? Does it move? Let's see. Okay, here. So, uh, I have quite a lot to cover. It's, my lecture is organized in these different sections. I'm not going to go through them. Uh, but I do want to Where's, okay, I do want to say that I not only find this topic important, interesting, but also I feel a personal uh, link to speak about this topic in Vancouver. Not because, you know, earlier this month there was a international inter um, foreign ministers conference here in Vancouver. That reminds me of the Korea War, but in fact, uh, it's something earlier. I came here in 86, uh, right in the middle of Expo 86. And the theme, transportation and communication, world in motion, world in touch, celebrates the spirit of our globalization. And in the China Pavilion, I saw all the iconic symbols of Chinese achievements um, in this area. Um, so, so this is a picture of the Expo. Uh, actually, of the four uh, so-called Asian Chinese inventions, in com three are in communication, paper making, printing, and the campus. The campus. Uh, and of course, the Silk Roads started as early as the Han Dynasty. But by way of introduction, I actually like to provide some historical context to the uh, Bell and Roads Initiative. I want to highlight uh, the following three episodes in China's twist interaction with the world. Uh, these are the dates, three events. Uh, one is uh, 1405 to 1432. That's the period when Zheng He completed his voyages to Southeast Asia and East Africa. He started almost a century before uh, that of Columbus. And then another very important date as a uh, historian uh, history of communication, it's the year 1871 and 1873. During that time, the Danish company, Great Northern, actually secretly installed the first telegraph lines on Chinese soil in violation of the agreement with the Qing court because the Qing court said we didn't want this. Uh, then forward one, one century ahead, between 1971 and 1975, while China was still uh, in the middle of uh, the last uh, years of the Cultural Revolution period, uh, China completed its largest foreign aid project, the Tanzania Zambia Railway Project, in support of the then Third World Socialism during the Cold War period. Mao said, even though we don't have money, even we can't build, we, won't, we will forego building our own railways in China to set this, uh, building this railway. So this is a picture of Zheng He's voyages. So although actually Adam Smith in his book, uh, Wealth of Nations, regard China as having an ideal market economy, uh, in what, um, in comparative historic, uh, economic history, being called the Great Divergence Debate, China did not develop itself into an industrial capitalist economy. Instead, as we all know, industrial capitalism developed in Europe, propelling maritime based colonial expansion on a truly global scale. And during this process, of course, telegraph and the railway were Europe's key technologies for accelerated industrial and colonial expansion. That's why European companies were so keen for the Qing dynasty to agree to have telegraphs installed, right? So now, forward to uh, the contemporary context. Uh, although the PRC, as a modern state, inherits much of imperial China's territory and the population, and as such, it was called, the PRC has been called uh, a civilization, pretend to be a state. Um, it was important to remember that it was, it is a product of anti, 
imperialist and anti-capitalist globalization from below or from the peripheries. So post Mao China, before um, the in isolation as a result of Western boycott really, and then later um, the split with the Soviet Union, got reintegrated with the US dominated global market system through an export oriented and an ICT driven paradigm um, that's been called Chimerica, China and America, right? So at the cost of massive social and ecological deficits, China has accumulated huge industrial and infrastructure building capacities. Think about the bridges the, or the roads. Medium to high range technological capacities uh, through the state's very deliberate uh, leapfrog policy that later in the past few de two decades or a decade and a half focused on indigenous innovation. And the telecommunication area, again, is uh, in the cutting edge. It basically leapfrogged from G2 when uh, China was really uh, following the foreign corporations to now setting the international standards for G4 and then G5. Right now it's in the rivalry. And of course, the most important part, massive US dollar foreign reserve, right? So China's foreign reserve earning workshops, uh, it's been called the workshops of the world, right? We all know the sweatshops in Shenzhen, but let's know is the fact that even my childhood living space was now my aunt's one person's workshop. That's in the remote countryside. That place where my aunt has this little um, table set up with the plastic toys stuff is literally where I grow up, where I play. This door here is my next door. So all, everybody in China has been mobilized to join the work factory. And of course, you know, the foreign reserve is huge. Uh, the, at the highest is 3.84 trillion, but in the past few years, three or four years being uh, Decline, and this is a picture from the Wall Street Journal uh, just before the economic crisis. Uh, America as a marriage made in heaven, because in this marriage, uh, Chinese, a poor country, China, a poor country, actually lends money to the U.S. to buy the consumer goods that China produce. And so China produce, U.S. consume. But this order, of course, from the point of view of much, uh, many people in China, especially sometimes in the Chinese media, they will say it's an uneven, unfair order, okay? And this is a, a very, won't, I won't say typical, but a very interesting example. It was a Chinese media report of a Chinese Academy of Science study about uh, the status of global economic affairs. And it says that in the year 2001, US gained 7.4 trillion in what it called hegemonic dividends. Don't ask me to explain now, I, I can later for, from the report, okay? And it says that of, this accounts for 52.38% of US GDP. And then on the China side, it lost 3.7 trillion or 51% of its GDP or 16% of its educational budget. Even more, 60% of Chinese workers' time were spent on creating surplus value for international monopoly capital. So you can see, you know, behind this is the market's the vocabulary, right? Uh, so not only it's not uneven, uh, unfair, but of course, as all we know, uh, we know it's also crisis ridden. So first you have the 97 financial, uh, Asia financial crisis. Uh, in response, the Chinese state uh, put up a 434 billion package in basically base uh, construction. Uh, and then it also launched uh, the Western China Development Program in 1999 and 2000. Uh, here you can already see the precursor to the Bell and the Roads. And also it uh, started 
the going out strategy, that is for corporate China, for Chinese companies to invest overseas. And then, of course, it's the mother of all um, crisis so far, right? The global financial crisis of 2008. And then that's the beginning of the unraveling of the Chimarican order. Again, in response, the Chinese government put out a huge stimulus package, 4 trillion in renminbi, um, equivalent of uh, 586 billion US dollar stimulus. And uh, much of that money, again, goes to construction. And of course, the digitalization of the Chinese economy, as Yu Hong wrote in a very uh, important uh, book recently. And of course, even that is still has to address explosive domestic social tensions, the threat of uh, Twitter revolution, all that, and then, of course, intensified geopolitical tensions with the US. So by two, uh, 2009, uh, this is uh, a cartoon in the New York Times. America has become a must, uh, monster, and uh, the US and China both try to contain it. Um, so here you can see the, the Bell and Rhodes uh, initiative, the geoeconomic imperatives. Uh, the Chinese state had to address declined U.S. demand, manage huge U.S. foreign reserve. Uh, there's in a lot of discussion about U.S. dollar hegemony, right? Some of the most popular books about, uh, about um, currency war, U.S. financial um, Dollar, U.S. dollar hegemony. Also, overcome industrial overcapacity, rebalance uneven regional development, especially the fact that Western China and the southwestern part of China were really, um, in terms of investment, in terms of quality life, everything is lagging behind. And of course, secure raw material and energy supply, right? So that's the geopolitical economic side. Then the geopolitical side, by November 2011, uh, Obama had, you know, with the war on terror, Afghanistan, all that, uh, the U.S. tried to wind down the war on terror, right? Uh, Obama had articulated uh, the pivotal to Asia strategy. That is uh, the focus of U.S. foreign policy, U.S. military is going to move from the Middle East, from Afghanistan towards uh, East Asia to contain China. Uh, of course, the Trans-Pacific uh, Trade Agreement, the TPP, was the trade piece in which China was excluded. But the most important were the renewed and strengthened U.S. military alliances in the Asia-Pacific, uh, in places like Australia, right, uh, India, in what is well known in the literature as the C-shaped encirclement ring, and again, on the internet, there are many of these kind of pictures. This is one picture that's uh, about U.S. Army bases and the so-called lily pad uh, encircling China, right? And this is another picture on the internet called How America Wants to Check China's Expansion. And this is, you know, it, the different colors represent uh, the degree of friendliness uh, to the U.S. So you can have India, here and then, so uh, so in so in terms of the rationale, so it's clear the Chinese state by the early 2010s realized it need to reorient it towards Euro Asia and Africa. To in, in the official rhetoric, it's called uh, increased openness or multi-dimensional openness. Of course, the Chinese state itself won't say this is geopolitical strategy. But in the words of uh, this US analyst, uh, Lauren, she was saying that uh, a transnational, uh, transcontinental infrastructure will help hedge against possible disruptions to maritime supply in the event of conflict. And then, like I said earlier, uh, the interior part of China has been a focus of a Chinese state investment uh, even since uh, the Asia financial crisis. Now, the Chinese state, early on, it opened up the coastal areas like Shenzhen, but now, and towards the U.S. in the Pacific. Now, the Chinese state want to turn interior China into the new frontier of openness and the development to realize Xi Jinping's 
China dream, right? So again, in terms of in strategic terms, this is being interpreted as deepening China's strategic space, and this will help counter alleged U.S.-led efforts to contain the, the country's rise. So because the U.S. is pivotal uh, towards East Asia, China, the Chinese, what Chinese can do is to retreat to the back, right? So China will pivot to um, a westward. So that's uh, the strategic idea. So uh, in 2013, late 2013, uh, Xi Jinping came, uh, became the party secretary in late 2012, right? Uh, he, Xi Jinping announced the Bell and Road Initiative in his two trips overseas. And the idea is that uh, these are some of the key ideas. First is to build trade and uh, infrastructure networks connecting Asia with Europe, Africa through land, which is the belt, and then maritime roads, which is the uh, road. And then uh, the plan focuses on Euro-Asia and Africa, but also it's an open plan. Actually, the latest out of the Davos uh, form was the discussion of the Polo Silk Road, you know, open up the northern passages. And also the Chinese state, according to US news report, were busy inter uh, speaking to Latin American countries to, uh, for the similar kind of infrastructure connection. Uh, so, uh, and also uh, connectivity is the key word. And so want to establish connectivity in five realms, F policy, finance, flow of money, infrastructure, trade, and the people to people. Although in Chinese actually it's Ming Xin Xiang Tong, which sounds much more closer, like people's heart will be linked. Then my daughter said that sounds very cheesy. Uh, but people to people really does not carry uh, the, the Chinese meaning of the term Ming Xin Xiang Tong. Okay, uh, then you know, uh, this initiative articulates with major region, regional and national development initiatives. For example, the European Union itself already has infrastructure projects. Uh, the, uh, Russia has always has a very clear uh, integration plan between the European and Asia part of the country. So the, this Belt and Road Initiative has been busy trying to connect up with those other existing initiatives. And also, the initiative get its inspiration, inspiration from the Silk Road, right? So in Xi Jinping's speech, the spirit of the Silk Road represents peace, cooperation, openness and inclusiveness, and mutual learning and mutual benefit. All very good. And of course, the Chinese state put money behind it. So it set up multilateral Asia, uh, the multilateral Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, almost uh, equivalent of the kind, you know, World Bank, right? And with initial money, uh, like 100 billion US dollar, it's a multilateral bank. And then, more specifically, the Chinese state set up a state-owned uh, Silk Road Fund. Actually, the chair of that fund is a woman. I've met her one time at a function. And both supports um, financing of the project. Uh, but uh, here I think it's very important to say that the new Silk Road idea is really not new, okay? So um, in 1990, just <laughs> as the Cold War in Europe uh, came to an end, um, Edward Shever the Nazi, right? The Soviet foreign minister, then Soviet foreign minister, spoke in poetic language of a post-Cold War dream of Euro-Asia in integration through the revival of the Silk Road. And it, he said, and I quote, with slow moving, caravans giving way to optical cable technology and electronics that can bring together in one single entity the formerly divided worlds. Then a couple of years later, Soviet Union, no more. Then, uh, then in 2011, uh, just as the US was ready to, or try to pull out from Afghanistan, uh, then, 
U.S. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton spoke at a conference. Uh, about, actually, the conference name is called uh, Silk Road Ministerial Meeting or something. And she said, again, she described you know, all the golden age uh, in which Afghanistan was at the center of that flourish uh, Euro-Asia um, integration. Uh, she said, let's set our sights on a new Silk Road, a web of economic, economic and transition connections, I might type it wrong, that will bring, to, bring together a region that too long tore apart by conflict and division. So this is the third time. In Chinese, we have a saying, you know, good things has to, you know, for the third time, it has to do something real. Uh, now the Chinese state, again, is reviving, or if not reviving, kind of continue on this dream of uh, connecting Euro-Asia uh, with the Silk Road, um, the new Silk Road idea. The, um, and it has put political will and money on the map. Uh, there are many maps of this um, BRI initiative available. This one I just choose uh, randomly. The red ones are the, the Silk Road economic uh, corridor. And then the blue one represents the marine time Silk Road. And uh, with the red one, there are many uh, sub-projects. For example, the key, one of the flagship projects is uh, what is known as the CPAC. It's the Pakistan-China Economic Corridor. And the Chinese state treat this as the most important flagship of the project. Um, the investment has gone from uh, earlier 40-some uh, billion to 54.5 billion. And the idea is to uh, connect Xinjiang, Kashgar, all the way to the port on uh, the Indian Ocean for that, so that you can bypass uh, the Maruga Street and uh, other areas. Uh, so 2017 was a very important year for the development of this initiative. Uh, of course, it was during the 19th Party Congress uh, in October that Xi Jinping announced that China or socialism with Chinese characteristics has entered a new era in, you know, new, new, right? New China reform and now new era. Uh, that's October, but before that, the most very important event was uh, about last year this time. Uh, Xi Jinping gave a speech at the Davos Economic Forum, World Economic Forum, and uh, very uh, actively promote and defend globalization, so much so that you know, US media was reporting that the world has turned upside down. Uh, and then in May, uh, Xi Jinping hosts this huge uh, BRI summit in Beijing. Uh, and then October, uh, the party congress not only announced a new era, but also revised the party's constitution. And actually, the BRI was written into the constitution. That is, the Communist Party is making it a mission. It's very it, to promote this. And then in December, the Communist Party of China uh, hold a dialogue with world political parties. Again, uh, it became a major diplomatic event through which uh, the Chinese party can promote the initiative. So now a little bit more uh, detail about the communication dimension. Uh, I understand communication as uh, consisting two parts. One is the infrastructure. The other is the content, the meaning, right? The storytelling. So I will elaborate uh, the roles of this, um, of this two, two aspects of the communication in the entire uh, BRI initiative. Among the BRI in the infrastructures, roads, port, uh, energy, pipes, all that, telecommunication and the information networks, submarine cables, fiber optical cables, satellite, data centers, all that, constitute the digital and informational silk roads. These are all official words. And they are supposed to play critical roles in the overall strategy. Critical in two senses. One is pioneering. That is, uh, telecommunications companies like Huawei uh, and uh, 
manufacturers, also internet companies, are supposed to take a leading role in these projects. And uh, most people have probably have heard of Huawei, right? Interestingly, Huawei as the telecom maker start in China uh, very, um, in the, in the, it has because transnational corporations had already occupied China's market in the 80s and the early 90s, Huawei ended up starting in remote areas, in the countryside. And then from there, it kind of moved into provide service equipment to the uh, developing countries. Now, of course, Huawei, just as earlier this month, was trying to sell its latest uh, iPhone, rivaling Apple, uh, the latest Apple in the US market, and they got blocked, right? So um, Chinese telecom companies are supposed to take the lead uh, as a pioneer in uh, this uh, overseas expansion. Furthermore, telecommunications are supposed to be foundational in the sense that ICT products are to provide system integration or what's called the digital group to non-digital infrastructure projects such as railway, airport, energy pipes, and also uh, with electronics to support uh, electronic transfer of money, the internationalization of uh, renminbi. Uh, and uh, so here I want to start highlight uh, two areas, basically. One is, as I said earlier, um, the telephone companies, especially uh, internet companies. China, because of the party's uh, censorship or protection, domestic, uh, China is the only country probably in the world that nurtured its own domestic internet companies. Facebook was blocked, um, right? Uh, so what you have is what's called the, early on called the BATS, but now it's B-A-G-T. Um, Baidu as the search agent, uh, search engine, uh, Alibaba, right, uh, as the online everything, still, and then Tencent, equivalent of Twitter. Uh, in China, people use it called WeChat and in many other services. And the purpose is to form a China-centered global internet. And the most important piece was just announced not long ago in November 2017. Uh, the Chinese state announced the state action plan to develop a world-leading IPv6 based next generation internet. As some of you may know, uh, current internet technology uh, is based on IPv4 protocol, techno technical protocol. I don't have time to explain or I don't understand anyways. But the point is the current IPv4 has limited internet address. When the US allocate those address, Stanford University may get more than you know, a third world country. Also, uh, all the root servers were hosted in the US. Furthermore, there's a security issue, right? People remember the Snowden expansion, um, exposure. Uh, with IPv6, uh, it's said to have unlimited internet addresses for things like, you know, internet of things, artificial uh, intelligence, clouding computer, all that kind of thing, and it's more secure. So the Chinese state is uh, right now in the process of, uh, of developing and moving uh, to, from ITV4 based internet to IPv6 internet. And the Chinese state uh, want to make sure that China is the lead one, the leading one in this process. Also, another less discussed uh, aspect is China's uh, space satellite technology. And here you, you have, uh, again, this is the official word, the BRI uh, space information corridor. It centers on the Beidou navigation system, uh, Beidou uh, navigation satellite system to provide uh, a GPS alternative to uh, Belt Road countries. Uh, right now, this alternative satellite system already covers 30 countries, uh, 30 Belt Road countries. And the Chinese state is going to launch more satellites this year to make uh, the objective is by the end of this year, all the Belt Road countries will be able to uh, get uh, Beidou's service. 
And of course, uh, the idea is also that uh, this will um, reach global coverage by year 2000. And on the cultural side, of course, uh, communication uh, is very important for storytelling, right? So the BRI becomes uh, the uh, platform through which China can project its notion of globalization. So there has been intensive mobilization of media and cultural industries in telling the China story. And of course, nobody tells or tries harder uh, than Xi Jinping himself uh, in his May 2017 promotion of video for the BRI. So I'm going to show that to you. Uh, it's a little bit long, five minutes, uh, over five minutes. Uh, hopefully you can bear with it, but if you can't, uh, take your cell phone break. <laughs> uh, it's Chinese, it's, it's Xi Jinping's propaganda, so watch at your discretion. Uh, the theme the title is called 大道之行也,天下为公. If you learn one, chi one Chinese sentence tonight from me, that's it. Uh, when the great way prevails, the world is equally shared by all. This is the, my translation, or my favorite translation. But in the video you will see the translation is called A great cause should be pursued for common good. Perfectly fits the bell on the road, right? So here is the video. Let me see if I can show it. Arlene Sanyan, Indonesia. 分别提出了建设丝绸之路经济带和二十一世纪海上丝绸之路的合作倡议。我的家乡，中国陕西省，就位于古丝绸之路的起点。站在这里，回顾历史，我仿佛听到了山间回荡的。世界充满着不确定性，人们对未来既寄予期待，又感到困惑。世界怎么了？我们怎么办？这是整个世界都在思考的问题，也是我一直在思考的问题。一带一路的倡议，就是要以互联互通为着力点，促进生产要素、自由便利流通，打造多元合作平台，实现共赢和共享发展。“一带一路”倡议是中国根据古丝绸之路留下的宝贵启示，着眼于各国人民追求和平与
，而是沿线国家的合唱。三年多来，已经有一百多个国家和国际组织积极响应支持，“一带一路”的朋友圈正在扩大。大道之行也，天下为公，让我们更加紧密地团结起来，携手构建合作共赢新伙伴，同心打造。人类命运共同体。携手，向着未来前进。Okay, so you can. This is Xi Jinping. You know, made the narration himself. Ah,、uh, so can think about the effort put into it. So in this video, you can see it kind of rediscovers a pre-Western centric past, some called globalization 1.0, to project a future. Globalization 3.0,、uh, and it, in the middle of the video, you can see the critique, implicit critique of current program problems, right? And it kind of reappropriates ancient Chinese version of it's called 大同天下为公 the ideal society,、uh, where everything is publicly shared. And then also, you can see he sees specifically that、uh, history is made by the brave. So we can see, of course, you need courage, but almost like a heroic version of history, which I see as quite different from Mao's version of you know people making history, or、well, at least that's Mao's rhetoric, right? And then in the end, the BRI becomes a means to realize this notion of the community of with shared future for mankind. That's the official translation.、Uh, so, what is the BRI then? It's a contradiction. It's paradox. It's dialectics, or maybe it's like. This video tries to say it's the Tao, the wisdom, right,、uh, of the East. So it is a spatial fix. There's no problem with that,、uh, but it's inspired by a temple sensibilities. It's a strategic concept, but it's costed as a techno-economic discourse. The bell, the road. It's a platform for connectivity, championed. By a commanding, controlling, and a censor state, censoring state, it's a unilateral call on the part of China、uh, for multilateralism. Some people call it this is a new WTO.、Uh, it's a plea for win-win coordination. That's really the, the the key word in a global order dominated by the logic of capitalist, intercapitalist rivalry, zero-sum competition. It's a, also a non-confrontational, confrontational means to prevent a predicted collusion.、Uh, in the past few years, the U.S. media has filled with、uh, stories or reports about this.、Uh, I don't know how to pronounce Thucydides trap, meaning that when two, you know, a new power arises and then the old power is defending, then there will be a war. So it. Has all kinds of risks and uncertainties. Uncertainties.、Uh, 
The project covers 65 countries. Uh, investment numbers of investment varied. I've tried different sources. Uh, between 60 uh, billion U.S. dollar to 300 billion. One trillion is the often cited project number. Uh, in the Chinese press, you have reports of ex uh, expanded support. Uh, project launches, but also there has been quite a number of cancellations and suspensions. Just in the last two months of last year, uh, cancellations, cancellations and uh, defers of projects due to um, internal issues in three countries, Myanmar, Nepal, and uh, even Pakistan. Uh, also, it, witness, it has witnessed intensified geopolitical rivalries and a critique of Chinese imperialism, most vocally, of course, from analysis in the US and its allies, Japan, India, and Australia. Uh, one interesting thing is uh, this initiative has provoked uh, direct competition by, proposed by India and Japan. The name is, uh, I have seen different names, but one is called Asia Asia Africa Freedom Corridor. And uh, it was launched in the same month that China had its Belt and Road Summit, May to 2017. And uh, its description is foreground quality in structure, of course, you know, with Japanese technology, with the implied notion that the Chinese infrastructure is not high quality, right? Also, some India commentators have spoken of historical, the historical spice trade, saying, arguing that, you know, the Silk Road is a myth anyway, invented by, you know, a German geographer in 1877, act, and the actual spice trade uh, between India and uh, uh, Africa and the Mediterranean countries are more significant. Also, uh, the project has provoked the revival of two U.S. Uh, India infrastructure projects. One is the Silk Road project that Hillary uh, discussed in 2011. Another is uh, the Indo-Pacific Economic Corridor. You can see happy uh, prime ministers of Japan and uh, India meeting. Uh, India's uh, Prime, uh, Prime Minister Modi meeting African country leaders in a conference. Uh, conflicts uh, ongoing and uh, in telecommunications, the latest is uh, Australia's opposition against uh, Solomon Islands trying to connect up uh, with uh, Sydney through undersea cable and Huawei was originally contract contracted, but uh, the Australian government uh, protest um, on the basis of uh, security considerations. And uh, in, um, earlier, just a few days ago, as I was researching this, the project was canceled. And Australia government is going to now provide uh, money, uh, as foreign aid money, to the Solomon Islands. So already, I guess, the Solomon Islands is benefiting <laughs> from this competition. Uh, and then in transportation, of course, one of the uh, very well-known episodes was the China-India dog bomb sent off. Uh, last summer. Uh, here is the, the uh, picture of the undersea cable. Uh, this is how our, we got our internet, right? These are all the pipelines. They have fancy names like T, Dream, all that. Uh, and then uh, different views, I can't provide you know, enough sample of this, but uh, it's even within one country, like Pakistan, is uh, you know, considered as China's most important ally. Uh, you have elites, like a scholar in Pakistan saying that, well, at Pakistan assists China uh, in its initial global integration. Actually, uh, it helped uh, with uh, Kissinger's visit to China. But now it's time to reap the profits, dividends. Then you have local um, activists who argue that, uh, you know, the C-SPAN project, CPAC project is a conspiratorial plan. Then actually when uh, my talk was announced, some gentleman sent me this email saying that, oh, Professor Zhao, I happen to know this story, which is actually uh, written by an Indian scholar condemning Chinese credit imperialism or financial imperialism. And the Chinese credit to small nations is compared with opium. Yeah, and also um, a U.S. strategist, uh, you know, I cited her before. She said 
you know, this Belt and Road means uh, a single centric Euro Asia order against Western interests and the values. Of course, Western interests is so broad. Whose interests, right? Uh, it also says it will be devastating for the poorest countries with unmanageable debts and the loss of control over important assets. And then, of course, inside China, you have people like Zhang Weiwei, who, is, uh, who was an uh, interpreter for Deng Xiaoping. And he said, you know, behind the BRI is a proven China model, uh, which includes things such as, uh, if you want to get rich, build roads. And he, he said, you know, ball it, you know, one person, one vote doesn't help. I don't have time to go through all the points. But he, basically, he's uh, saying that this is proven in China. Of course, the problem is what's proven in China may not be applicable you know, to other countries, right? Uh, and uh, so there are all kinds of uh, disruptions, threats. Uh, people have written a lot about this, you know, the different uncertainties. One author list 11. Again, I can't uh, review them all for you, but these are some. Disruption threats by unstable governments and radical groups. Entanglement in regional conflicts and domestic politics. Lack of understanding of nationalistic sentiments, intertwined race, ethnic, and class tensions. Well, Guada is not Shenzhen. The reason is, well, Guada, Guada is, uh, is this little fish village uh, a port, right? Uh, but because of the ethnic uh, situation there, uh, the people who come in to build this port uh, are regarded as being, you know, coming and taking away, you know, the spaces the hometowns of the existing ethnic group, right? Uh, but Chinese don't have this idea, you know, early on everybody goes to Shenzhen, nobody is resisting. Uh, so this is really uh, very challenging. Uh, also, conflict for Chinese side, conflict is statist and private agendas. Uh, nowadays, many private corporations are doing, you know, mining in Africa, and what, who knows what's the standard, right? They just simply export what they do in China, in Sanxi, you know, in the worst uh, labor standards, and then to Africa. And of course, you have uh, backlashes. And then uns unsustainable financial investments. Uh, actually, the interesting thing is, the most hostile U.S. anti-China critique echoes some of the internal ultra-leftist critiques. Uh, they both see this, uh, the BRI as a trap and even suicidal. Uh, it's overseas, you know, expansion for Chinese exploitation. Uh, it's a sign of, uh, not a sign of strength, but a sign of crisis. And in a metaphor that's quite interesting, saying that, well, after uh, the reformers inviting uh, the wolf, that is the U.S., into the Chinese house, now the wolf is attacking, and then the Chinese has to find a way to escape. Uh, so, uh, but there are other scholars, a little bit more, you know, what uh, some call the new leftist scholars in China, uh, who still believe that about Chinese socialism. Uh, the argument is that, you know, this initiative has no inherent progressive nature. It will be contingent upon su successful domestic resistance against the domination of the capital logic. Uh, uh, what we need to do in China is to overcome domestic labor uh, exploitation, thereby turning the BRI into, uh, in Wang Hui's words, common pass for 20th century, 21st century socialism. And the argument is that, well, this is not even a theoretical question. It's a practical question. We need to intervene. We need to make arguments, all that. Uh, a Taiwanese scholar, likewise, uh, Chen Guangxi, many of us in cultural studies knows him, uh, said the same, similar things. So I'm just going to really quickly uh, conclude uh, with one observation. We are at a historical crossroad. Intensive contestations for the future of the global order are being fought out through various invocations of the past. Uh, in fact, we are still in the middle of an unfolding world historical encounter between China and global capitalism, which, by the way, is uh, the title of a very good book by Lin Chun. And this uh, encounter between Lord McCartney and the Qing Emperor Qianlong in the year of 1793, uh, of course, was a fateful moment. And the economists just can't forget, right? So, but the resulting fusion of a CPC-led PRC state 
speaking triple language. I don't know how, he, how the Chinese state did it, but so far has been doing this. 40 years of reform, speaking champion free market, and then 500 years of socialism. Domestically, Chinese media still talk about that. And then 2,000 years of Tong dream for great harmony. So this fusion of the Chinese state carry all these different heritages. It's a truly complex and multi-dimensional uh, phenomena. And it's not, of course, clearly not, you know, a picture like this uh, can be uh, explained. And, no, and so, of course, this was censored in China. Uh, the BRI, it's the latest articulation of this conflict encounter between China and the global capitalism. As such, it has been turned into a multifaceted side of global collaboration and competition. Whether, in this context, whether dominant frameworks of Orientalism, Cold War mentality, state control versus market freedom, as a dichotomy, state versus society, right? And then all, all the ideas of inter imperialist rivalry, zero sum game, whether all this uh, language are adequate for understanding what appears on the horizon is a serious, challenging, and a, I think very urgent question. It is a question of war and peace. And uh, so one suggestion, I think we need to be open-minded uh, Four ideas like the BRI, but also keep a critical eye on the words and the deeds of states and the corporations, not only China, but the West, US. Uh, but we also need to guard against our own inner anxieties and fears, including fear mongering and opportunistic manipulations at a time of great turmoil and uncertainty. So I I'm just want to leave you with one story. Uh, this is one man's, one bell, one road, story. I, I do research in the countryside. One day I walk into this remote village called Yanxia, underneath the cliff uh, in my hometown. Then I met a BRI pioneer. He looks, doesn't look like a Chinese um, peasant in the south. He looks very Central Asia. So a group of us got excited and said, where are you from? And he said, I always grow up here. Uh, but he has always been called a foreigner. And we choose the lineage book, 600 year old, reveals that he probably carried genes of a Central Asia ethnicity during the earlier Silk Road era. Uh, and then he was a migrant worker. He didn't go to school, in that, uh, too much school, become a migrant worker, and then he was an electrician, I think. And he was sent by his company to do business in Indonesia. The next thing we know is that he became a businessman selling goods and then opened factories. He has traveled to 20 countries, both on the Silk Road and then uh, around um, Southeast Asia. So in him, I saw, and I don't think he even knows the Bill Road, or he doesn't even, he's not interested in the official discourse. And so for me, it's individuals like this that kind of embodies, of course, his exceptional case, embodies uh, a Bell Road by for the people. And uh, that's idealistic, but here's, that's my thought. Thank you very much. Well, who would have guessed that one belt, one road could give rise to such a multiplicity of interpretations, conflicts, history, and communication? Uh, there's been a lot of issues thrown at you and put on the table, and we have a chance for some comments or questions. Uh, Bethany and Heather have some microphones so we can make sure not only that we can hear you, but uh, as this is taped for the YouTube channel, people watching later can hear you as well. So if someone wants to put up, we won't be able to take Everyone's question, but we'll try to take uh, a few in the next 15 minutes or so. So who wants to ask the first question or put the first comment? There's so, there's a, Heather, there's someone right next to you there. Why don't we start right there? If you just could say your name and, uh, and, and mm -hmm. put your question. My name's Catherine. Um, thank you for a very interesting lecture. <clears throat> um, my question is about Djibouti in Ethiopia. That was um, on the map showing the economic route. I would just like you to speak a little bit about it because I understand that is one of the sites that is being um, quite well developed. And of course, it's in a very um, political part of the world right now. 
And the Chinese presence in Ethiopia, I understand, is huge, is, is mammoth in terms of infrastructure, et cetera. So yes, and right across the water, of course, is Yemen. Right. Mm -hmm. So you need to go to the microphone. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think in Xi Jinping's promotional video, he mentioned about Djibouti, too. Yeah, so uh, I don't know the exact project there. I think there's a port, right? And uh, it's, it's, I think that's where uh, the, the, uh, the Chinese Navy want to have some connections there, importance there. And so I don't know what else details uh, to say. Or I say that, yes, I recognize that place. I understand it's a place that's very important. Uh, in the bell, uh, in the in the marine time roads. Okay. Do you have um, a? Yeah, sorry. There's there's a woman up here who has her hand up. I don't. And then there's someone back there, Bethany, who will go to next. So you got to pick them out. <laughs> Please go ahead. Hi. Uh, yes, my name is Anna, and I want to ask: like, um, has this initiative been analyzed from the point of view of what would it be? What would be its um, impact in the ecosystem of the countries involved? Mm -hmm. back, well, to the, back to the mic. Yeah, uh, <laughs> different projects, right? Uh, one of the critiques is that you know some of the Chinese projects do not respect uh, the environment, and uh, so uh, so in. So it depends when you when you talk about ecosystem. Do you mean uh, like ecological side, or even you know in terms of social power relations? Because I think there are both dimensions. Uh, some project in terms of environmental assessment. Uh, I know there are quite a, a number of projects that has issues recently. Uh, early on, with for example, some of the um, hydroelectrical projects, and then the ecosystem. The way I understand also involves local power relationships. Uh, the ethnicity relationship uh, and the also um, even class relationships. So again, it depends on different countries. Uh, I don't, uh, and uh, also because of the interactions, critiques of foreign governments, activist groups, this will have been compelled the Chinese government to adjust. So I, I think it's a process for negotiation. There's no one fit all plan in terms of uh, ecological issues. Now there's someone, Bethany, can you pick up someone back there? And I'll see if we can just pull this oh. microphone out a little bit so Zhao can speak right out here. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Thank you for a very interesting um, lecture. Um, according to the Guardian uh, newspaper, Le Monde and uh, Christenstein Monitor, um, the Chinese cur young currency is uh, around 2% in the worldwide market. And they said, they said that basically with this uh, row bell, uh, with this zero project, it will help uh, expand the use of Chinese currency so uh, in the future, when Chinese currency become a dominant currency, uh, what, what will the world economic order will look like when the US currency will no longer be the, the world only dominant currency? Well, that's not, <laughs> that's a, I don't know. It depends, I guess. That's a huge question. Uh, of course, you know, from my personal point of view, I don't think it would be a good idea for, uh, you know, Chinese dollar, had, Chinese yuan hegemony to replace U.S. dollar hegemony. Mm -hmm. uh, I hope that right now, maybe, you know, the internationalization of uh, Chinese currency might provide a counterbalance, but it's too, too hard for me to imagine what's the future when uh, the Chinese currency dominates. I, I certainly hope that's not, you know, it's one hegemony replace another. I certainly hope a more democratic situation. One thing we can be sure of is the Canadian dollar will not assert its hegemony. Right. Its hegemony. Uh, one thing I do want to see is... <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking, there's a, uh, we've got someone over here and then someone over there, Heather. So we can go right over here and then over in this side too. Thank you very much. My, my name's Eddie. Uh, I'd like you to know the uh, the difference of this Chinese bedroom and the Asian highway, Asian highway one and two, which has already started or more than two decades ago. So how does it correlate with the Chinese bedroom and the Asian highway? That's my first question. And my second question is, what is, you didn't mention anything about the morale of this uh, economic initiative. Supposing the crisis at the China, South China Sea and also the Hague uh, decision, how did China respect to this one? Thank you very much. 
the first is the difference between a Chinese vote and Asia. Um, you, you Sorry, to, can you repeat the first question? I just want to clarify question? the two questions. One is about yeah. uh, the first question is the Asian highway. Asian already, highway? Yes. Asian, Asian highway. highway which and then the second started. was about morale. Yeah, and, and the second question is about the morale. About yeah. Chinese yeah. morale. Chinese morale, yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm sorry, I have not heard about the Asia Highway. Mm. Do you have a specific highway in mind mm. or one of the ones that's building between China and the different Asia, uh, Southeast Asia countries? No, the Asian Highways have been started around about two decades ago and it was funded by uh, Japan and Korea. Mm -hmm. So how, you have mentioned about Russia and Europe participating. But how about Japan and Korea, which has also some of the financial power? And this Asian highways have already started uh, from Singapore onto Thailand and onto uh, uh, to across Burma to India. Okay, yeah, okay, so I can only categorically answer that. Uh, in the China, I already mentioned about the competition, right? And I, in the Chinese government's uh, initiative, the p objective, or at least uh, the hope is that, the current objective will be articulating ways, accommodating uh, and uh, integrating each other so that it's not, again, a zero-sum game. For example, I, I brought up the Indian competition. Actually, we don't have to fight which, you know, whether Spice Road or Silk Road is more important. What's important is that both China and India can uh, work together to uh, develop internally but also externally. So I. I, I don't, again, uh, my, my, my reading of the initiative is that the Chinese government is trying to uh, articulate with different ones. Uh, and the second, about morale, again, uh, it's a broad question. Uh, in, on, the, on the paper, on the rhetoric, the idea is peaceful development. The idea is uh, to uh, avoid regional conflict poverty reduction, uh, removal of structural inequality, that kind of thing. So all sounds very good. Uh, so I, I don't know. Um, and if you talk about whether this is money making, and of course, you know, domestic Chinese critiques, well, you know, during the Mao era, at least it's, you know, more uh, almost like a selfish, selfless uh, foreign aid. Nowadays, it's profit making. So I, again, I, I think it's important to uh, at this point, you know, uh, not to moralize the whole thing, to look at specific uh, projects and uh, initiatives and uh, intentions, and also the negotiation with different parties. And the question of morale? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's my point. That was your point? Yeah. Okay. Because that, 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 that video, I don't know about the rest Give of you, that you video read. struck me as it, if it was in English, it could have been from a, you know, a Democrat or Republican convention. I mean, it was <laughs> pretty polished stuff. Yeah. Whether it builds morale or not. Uh, there's someone over here, Heather, that uh, had their hand up. Yeah. Thank you very much for that presentation. It's wonderful to see um, uh, this kind of message about the Belt and Road. I'm, I'm from a, um, a group called the Society for the New Humanist Paradigm. We're probably the only independent not-for-profit in Canada promoting the Belt and Road, actually. And so that's why I'm here. I've attended a lot of seminars and investment conferences and um, expert, um, uh, heard experts speaking about the Belt and Road from the West, who are usually quite uh, critical mentioning most of the critiques that you put in your presentation. I would like to pose um, a question in the following context. We here in the West are used to a zero-sum game, meaning that we should feel guilty about our progress because there's not enough to go around and because of our success, the third world suffers. China has proven this wrong and it's being proven um, with every, um, every port that is built from, or rail line, that is built not from port you know, to the mine, but that is actually benefiting the entire community where cities are connected now, where before there were you know, swamps and deserts and the rest. Um, they're actually benefiting the general population. We are so infested in the West with this zero-sum mentality and it seems that China really understands non-zero sum and that there is an abundance quality to the One Belt, One Road. 
One project in particular in this context is the Bering Strait Tunnel that has been pro uh, already proposed by the Russian and the Chinese governments to both Canada and the United States. I'm wondering if that is still in the works, uh, one. Uh, I'm also wondering how um, and if, there, if you know of any uh, media projects that are coming about that can touch on this zero-sum versus non-zero-sum game mentality that we're so used to dealing with here. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I refrain from answer that specific <laughs> project because there are so many Bell Road, you know, projects going on. Uh, Although, you know, I, I read stories about how, you know, you know, one day maybe we can have underground connection between Canada and China or, what, or whatever. But uh, the idea of zero-sum game uh, versus win-win cooperation, I think you really, uh, really uh, hit the essence of this whole thing. And I, again, it's the question I pose, you know, I wonder whether the current framework uh, is enough to explain what's going on. And of course, uh, talk about what you said earlier, China has always seen, uh, you know, promoting the idea that we are a country that have achieved all this astonishing development in the past, uh, if you say it's 40 or earlier, 60 years, without colonizing others, without taking First Nations land, without going out to war. And, and that's something that China constantly emphasizes. And I don't think the West appreciate or understand enough. Uh, and of course, because of this zero-sum game idea, then that is, well, China is rising, therefore, it's going to expand. Uh, it's going to you know, invade. Um, other countries, all this and that. And, uh, and precisely because of that mentality, uh, the Chinese state dis decide to uh, propose this idea that, you know, let's make trade rather than war, right? Or at least that's the intention. Or at least that's the intention as expressed by uh, everything I've read so far <laughs> inside China and uh, in this video message. But, uh, Again, how this will evolve will depend on how we in the West respond. And I, I, there's one metaphor somebody say, well, it's like a child. How the child grow up depends how we behave towards it. And if everybody is hostile, you're going to be bad, you're going to be mad, you're going to be, you know, it might turn out that way. So also, again, I think this is an important time for dialogue and for the possibility of us to whether it is possible to think. If you think, you know, the current order is not working, of course it works for, for some people uh, very well, but for the majority of people uh, or the so-called 99%, if this is not working, then uh, when something new appears on the horizon, then maybe at least we need to give it, you know, some space at least to examine it before condemn everything. That's, thank you. The, the, the fact that the questioner has, uh, represents an organization from Canada, the one country that I didn't see you mention in all of this was Canada. The Chinese consulate hosted a One Belt, One Road initiative actually at Simon Fraser University in September. Do you see a particular role for Canada in trying to mediate all of this? Other than your own lecture, of course. Oh, yes. <laughs> Very important. Uh, it's interesting. Canada, uh, as I say, uh, historically, and especially early on, uh, Canada was, uh, you know, under Chuto, the father was playing a very uh, friendly role to China. And, uh, and I, I think in this context, I do feel that Canada can play a similar type of role. Uh, Although, you know, last, as I say, earlier this month, you know, with the Canada, U.S. hosting uh, the foreign minister meeting, for, the meeting of foreign ministers who participate in the war, um, the Korean war, it doesn't look like, you know, of course, this register very bad uh, in China. I didn't know this until friends inside China say, oh, what's going on in Vancouver? As if Vancouver is some, has done something wrong. I said, no, Vancouver didn't do anything wrong. <laughs> it's just the meeting happened here. So I do feel uh, politically Canada uh, can, uh, Canada, of course, is always called, you know, the continental integration with the US. And then uh, here we in the, Asia, in the Pacific uh, integration with uh, the uh, Asia Pacific um, 
facing Asia. So uh, that's political again. And then trade-wise, in terms of trade, of course, uh, the Belt Roads might, some people might say, well, because China is turning the West uh, in uh, Euro-Asia in interior, there might be less trade opportunities for Canada. But some others argue, well, there will be uh, still opportunities. For example, Canada's uh, infrastructure building abilities can be teamed up with China and to do things. Some people also say, well, why the Chinese can't come here and do something with, what is this, a port called the Chu Chu port in Manitoba? It's being abandoned by the U.S. to say why the Chinese can't come and buy it or, or do something. Uh, or the Northern Passage, right? So I think there are a lot of opportunities. Okay. And a double degree. <laughs> <laughs> because we can train people. And, and Canada has its own historical reference points in Norman Bethune as well. So we have all exactly. sorts of stuff yeah. going for a us. There's a question or two. Memories. We'll probably have time for three, actually, perhaps three more questions yeah, or no, comments. Th thank so. you very much. We are like-minded. So you, you just asked my question about the, uh, the impact on Canada and British Columbia as a Pacific gateway. And in this context of uh, surging uh, nativism and also a little bit of hostility towards foreign capital, so how British Columbians can benefit from BRI and also how can we contain and also tame this rampant uh, you know, uh, capital and, uh, from overseas. Yeah, well, uh, just a little bit further elaborating because I always compare Canada with Australia, in many ways, in terms of geopolitics. Uh, and right now, the tension in Australia is very high, right? Uh, in uh, kind of hostility vis-a-vis uh, -vis China. In Canada, I think the most important part, and also, also with many of these Bell Roads projects, is the intention of, at least from the Chinese side, in terms of a developmentalism might be good. But many of these projects are implemented without the participation of local people, without broad uh, consultation. So it's all between the states, between corporations. Uh, even though sometimes this might be good for overall long-term pro long prosperity or development, but uh, it's always the in internal politics and uh, the fact that many of these projects are carried forward without enough participation by uh, different constituencies. So I think it's, it's the containment of capital and also uh, in, like in Chinese domestic discourse to make sure the capital logic does not prevail or uh, dominate uh, decision making. Like two more questions. We have someone right over, Heather, there's someone, there's, there's a woman right over here who has her hand up, and then we'll take, well, I see two more. We'll take the one at the back here and the one in the middle there, and then that will have to be it, but you may have time during the uh, reception afterwards. Yeah, right back here, right over here. My name is Ingrid, and um, I'm a student of the Global Communications Double Degree Program, and I just wanted to talk about something we talked about in Professor Bill's class about um, the two phases of Chinese communication. And it was Guo Ming Chen's article, The Two Phases of Chinese Communication. And he, she was talking about Chinese compliance, um, compliance gaining stratagems as delusion, borrowing or misleading, distraction, indirect exploration, espionage, self-inflicting, adapting and deceiving. And then he goes ahead to say that the above variety of Chinese compliance gaining strategies shows the dynamic side of Chinese communication, which reflects that the Chinese are far beyond the superficial perception as being conservative, polite, humble, and self-controlled, but also can be much more humane as being artful, crafty, cunning, deceitful, and sly in interac interaction. And so I just want you to tie this into, because like coming from Ghana as I am, it all, like seeing what the Chinese people are doing in Ghana, like this kind of makes me think that this whole one belt, one road thing has more to it than it being like um, a commerce thing that is gonna save the world or something like that. Well, you brought up a lot of uh, adjectives describing Chinese communication. And I, for one thing, I oppose, you know, all that kind of essentialized, the Chinese. Um, I, I feel um, 
it's important that, like what I said earlier in my one my slide, they talk about the Tao of uh, the Belt and Roads. Uh, it is true that I, I believe this project, this thing, is much more than just infrastructure. It carries uh, strategic ideas. It it carries a contradiction in many ways, and I think again, um, it. it on the other hand, I, I don't think it's helpful to uh, show out all those uh, descriptions. Okay, well, the Chinese are inward looking, the Westerns are outward looking. We have way bypass that kind of essentialist understanding of a culture. And I think it's important to uh, analyze the political economic logics, uh, also um, as well the, the philosophical concepts behind. And uh, again, uh, also understand in our dialectical terms, that is, how this will evolve really does not really just hinge on the Chinese. It really also depends on uh, the interaction between China and uh, the rest of the world. And we have one right at the back and then one in the middle and then we'll have to wrap it up. Yes. Um, so my question is, uh, in Xi Jinping, or per, uh, President Xi Jinping's video, he said that uh, the Silk Road Initiative is to benefit all parties and I think um, I guess one of the visible or obvious uh, out outcomes of the Silk Road Initiative is that it benefits trade relations between bigger businesses. So, like, how does is there a plan in place, or how is it expected to bridge the gap between the working class and the elites? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. And if you look at uh, it, and uh, this is the tension between what you know in our communication study vocabulary, the tension between class and nation, right? Uh, in many cases, uh, because of the way, uh, like what I said earlier, the projects conducted, uh, it benefits the elites. And also, in many cases, it's the dominant ethnic elites, in uh, dominant ethnic groups in many countries. And so, how this can be benefiting to the low social classes, not, it's not only, again, contingent upon what the Chinese do, because the Chinese has made a Maybe a virtual or its own principle that we do not interfere with your domestic politics. So it, it really, you know, how these projects or this kind of opportunity can be taken up by other countries depends on internal struggles, uh, depends on the internal democratization of societies. And, and again, uh, this is the same thing in, as in China, like what I cite the New Left scholars. They are seeing that whether the Bell Road will become imperialistic or not depends also internal struggles to make sure uh, the Chinese political system uh, is becoming more democratic. So again, I don't have a simple answer, but the answer lies in both internal struggles inside China so that China's foreign policy can be more progressive, but also internal power struggles within those countries. But you certainly can't help expect China to go to certain third world countries or neighbor countries and uh, promote revolution because China did it before and it failed, right? And many countries, the elites in this country still have bad memories of China trying to export revolution, trying to support low social groups. And it, that's why, you know, it's so interesting in India, for example, the Maoist, well, they are the Maoist, believe it, right? They got inspirations from China's Maoist revolution. But these are rebels against the India government. And so you can imagine how China tried to uh, behave itself. What do you do? You can't just say, oh, I want to go to India, promote class poly equality. That's not going to go, right? So it's very difficult. And again, uh, while the transnational dimension matters, domestic struggles also matters, and it's in this articulation between transnational forces and internal forces that things might become better, or sometimes become worse. Well, that answer covered so much territory and summed it up. I'm tempted to end it there, but I promised someone right here a last question, and I cannot break my promise to this individual right here. That, uh, Heather, right here. Yep. Thank you so much. Uh, I enjoyed your presentation. I, I, I learned a few things. Um, I, I sympathize with the fact that this is a communications presentation, not a political science presentation. Um, but I'm pesky. I think political. there may be a relationship between there, the, the Yeah, there certainly is. <laughs> um, I, and I appreciate the fact that you mentioned, you know, the disclaimer before the, the, the video from Xi Jinping, and uh, you mentioned the word censorship in uh, the presentation as well. 
Uh, I, I can't help but think that I think the Chinese government would have welcomed this presentation. I'm curious to know whether or not uh, you think, I, 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 sorry, I'm curious to know whether this presentation would have been welcomed by the Chinese government. Oh my God. Uh, <laughs> I swear to the president that I did not get this checked. And why, if this happened to be welcomed by the Chinese government, so be it. Uh, and I, I don't like the fact that anything that's said, especially by an overseas Chinese scholar, will be, oh, will the Chinese government like it? But if I have to make something that, uh, that purposely to provoke the Chinese government, then I don't feel I'm doing my scholarship as well. So again, uh, this is my, my research. Uh, if it happened to be liked by the Chinese government, so be it. <laughs> Well, I think, I think the, que the question for us this evening is not whether the Chinese government liked this presentation, but whether you liked this presentation tonight. <laughs> and I think, uh, I, think, I think the value in the presentation, to pick up on Professor Zhao's general theme, is not in the presentation itself, but in the way you react to it, the response, how it makes you think and feel, what action you take, what views you carry out of here whether you are favorably disposed or not favorably disposed to certain ideas that were shared. And that's really what these lectures are all about, to bring ideas, to bring uh, insights. And in Professor Zhao, of course, we've had a wonderful opportunity to hear from a very dynamic scholar whose ideas just fly off the page <laughs> and onto the screen. And on behalf of all of you, I want to thank her for a fabulous presentation this evening. I also, I also want to remind you about SFU Public Square, which is sort of the umbrella for this presentation. But one thing that SFU Public Square does every year is it hosts a community summit on an issue that we think is important, and we hope the community agrees. And this year's summit, it really is on an issue that I, I, I can't think you could disagree is important. That's the future of work. We know that, uh, that there's all sorts of challenges and opportunities in technology, in uh, artificial intelligence, in globalization. And we know that as a society, we really need to think this through because the benefits and the, the potential threats are ones that should concern us all. And so we're going to challenge that whole idea. We're going to look at the future of work. We're going to have a week-long program. Look on the SFU Public Square website if you're interested in that program. There's one event in particular I want to encourage you to attend. It'll be at the Queen Elizabeth Theatre. Uh, it's an event that will uh, bring two leading U.S. commentators, Van Jones. Some of you will have heard of Van Jones. He was on CNN doing the messy truth. He was on last night commenting on the State of the Union. Anne-Marie Slaughter, who's president and CEO of New America. Van Jones was the green jobs advisor to President Obama. And they're going to be looking at the new world of work, thriving or surviving, uh, in a conversation with Laura Lynch from the CBC. It should be a great evening. That's on February 28th. The uh, Community Summit itself will run from the 26th to March 7th, and I encourage you to check it out. And check out all the SFU Public Square events. This one, there's a modest charge for, but most of them, there's no charge at all, as indeed there wasn't this evening, and as there won't be for the next President's Lecture. The next President's Lecture, you'll have to beat a path to Burnaby Mountain. It, hopefully, the weather will be a little nicer then than it is now. March 15th at the Diamond Alumni Center, Dr. Angie Brooks Wilson, who's chair of our biomedical physiology and kinesiology department, and head of cancer genetics at uh, Canada's Michael Smith Genome Center will be presenting a lecture. She hasn't told me what it's about yet, but it's going to be great. <laughs> so I hope you'll be there. Also, there is some coffee and some, uh, some tea and cookies, I think, at the back. You're welcome to stay. See if you can engage uh, Dr. Chow in a conversation. And thank you so much for coming out tonight. <laughs>